Hi everyone, my name is Jonathan Friedman and I'm a group leader over at the Hebrew University in Israel and today I want to share with you some of our newest and unpublished results about community co-evolution. So as you all know, microbes in nature form diverse and complex communities and these communities are involved in many important application areas and therefore there's a lot of interest in trying to control and engineer these microbial communities. And a key step in being able to do so is to be able to predict the composition of microbial communities. So a few years ago when I was a postdoc in Jeff Gore's lab over at MIT, uh, we set out to do a project looking at whether it's possible to predict the composition of a microbial community uh, based on the composition of pairs. So if I know uh, in co-cultures of pairs how much of each species there is, am I able to predict how much of each species there's going to be when I mix multiple species together. And the short answer is yes, it's possible. Uh, and to do that, we co-cultured pairs of species uh, and we looked at what composition they end up with. And then we used that information to make predictions about the composition of trios, three species combinations. So here I'm showing a ternary plot, showing the fractions of each one of the three species with nodes indicating a community composed entirely of one species and the center indicating an even abundance of all three species. Uh, and what you can see is that the prediction based on the pairs in this square matches very well the observed uh, com uh, composition of trios indicated by these dots. Um, and this is one example. Uh, we wanted to know whether this is a typical example uh, or an unusually good one. Uh, so we repeated this for over 50 trios and this enabled us to make a statistical statement uh, saying that about 90% of these trios, um, we, in 90% of these trios, we were able to predict accurately the trio composition from the pairs. And two important additional things to note. One is how repeatable the dynamics are. So the different initial conditions or replicates here, they all converge to the same fraction. The same is true in the trios. So when things are repeatable, predictions are easier. And the other one is the time scale. And so this experiment lasted about 50 generations. And what we wanted to know next, and is the subject of this talk, is what happens over longer time scales when evolution might play a significant role. So here I'm showing you a cartoon example where we have two species uh, equilibrating uh, pretty rapidly to some sort of ecological equilibrium. Um, and we want to know whether we're able to predict what happens over subsequent generations. Um, and surprisingly, we know very little about the dynamics uh, of microbial communities during co-evolution. Um, for example, we don't even know over what time scales does community composition change. So one option is that for hundreds of generations, community composition stays the same. In which case, predictions are easy. We can just make our uh, previous prediction on short time scales, uh, and it holds true for the rest. Uh, of, the, of the experiment. Uh, but of course things can be more complicated. Maybe we have a beneficial mutation in one of the species that makes it take over uh, and now we need to amend our prediction in some way because it's not going to be accurate just based on, on these short time scales. Um, but we don't know over what time scales uh, these changes occur. The other thing we don't know is when changes occur, how repeatable are they? So in this cartoon example and the same uh, changes occur in all the, our replicates. But of course, evolution has a random component to it. Mutations arrive at random times and in random locations in the genome. Uh, so it could be that the um, changes are not repeatable at all, and each replicate ends up with a very different composition, which would make predictions much, much harder. Um, so we wanted to first ask uh, over what time scales do changes occur and how repeatable they are. And so we conducted the following experiment. We took a set of 16 bacterial uh, species representing three phyla and, and we cultured them either in monoculture or we picked 51 pairs and 51 trios. Uh, again, many pairs and many trios, so we'll have statistical power and we'll be able to say what's typical and what's not. And for each one of these combinations, we had multiple replicates to assess the repeatability. And for each one of these combinations, we cultured them in minimal media and had propagated them through multiple growth dilution cycles 
for approximately 400 generations. And during that time, we measure the total OD, uh, approximating the overall biomass. And some interesting results there that I don't have time to discuss today. Uh, we also looked at the relative abundance, the composition of the community via plating. Um, so let's look at some examples of what uh, the composition looks like over coevolution. So here's a particular pair, and it starts from our uh, randomly imposed initial condition, arbitrary, and quickly changes to some sort of uh, ecological equilibrium, and then it stays there for the duration of the experiment. And a similar thing happens for this trio. So these are examples where nothing changes during coevolution, and prediction would be trivial. Um, here are two other examples uh, where, again, things rapidly converge to an ecological equilibrium, and then over subsequent generations, the composition changes uh, significantly, both in this pair and in this trio. So these are anecdotes. Um, we want to have a statistical statement, so we looked at all of our pairs, all of our trios across replicates, and, and we quantified how much the community composition changed uh, during coevolution relative to this ecological equilibrium, which we approximate as the composition at generation 70. Uh, so this line shows you the median overall communities, and you can see that it changes over time quite significantly. Some communities stay similar, but overall most of them uh, become more dissimilar during coevolution. So um, if we had these two cartoon examples at the beginning, we can say that uh, the typical situation is more similar to this, where within a few hundred generations, the community composition changes. Um, and the implications for predictability are that it deteriorates, as you would expect. So this is a, one example of a particular trio, uh, and I'm showing you the fraction of pairs of generation 70 indicated by the star, and the composition of the trios uh, indicated by these dots. And the prediction is given by the cross, and it's quite accurate at generation 70, uh, but at generation 400, the trio composition changed significantly, uh, and the prediction is no longer accurate. So looking at all of our trios, we can see that the red line indicating the prediction error based on the pair composition uh, at generation 70 um, starts out being fairly accurate, but then over time, the error increases and increases, and by generation 400, it's quite similar to this green line, and the green line indicates what would be the prediction error if we had no prior information at all. And so after 400 generations, knowing what the pair composition is at generation 70 is not really informative. It's almost as bad as not knowing anything. Okay, so we know that community composition changes and that deteriorates um, the, our predictability. Next, we want to know how repeatable are these changes. So again, looking at our four examples, we can see that in the cases that don't change, obviously things are, are fairly repeatable. There's some variation here that accumulates, um, but nothing changes, so it's repeatable. But the same is true for the cases that do change over time, like this trio the green species increases during coevolution, but you can see that all the different lines showing different replicates are fairly tight. Um, this pair um, has more variability in it, but still it's always the purple species that increases in abundance during coevolution. It increases by various amounts, but it's always the purple one. So again, let's quantify this um, for all of our communities and the blue line gives us the observed variability between replicates as a function of time. Uh, it increases a bit at the beginning uh, from our um, initial condition, which was identical for all communities, uh, but then increases very little or uh, just a bit during coevolution. And we compare it uh, to the green line showing what's the variability when we shuffle replicates across pairs. Um, so you can see that replicates are still much more similar to each other than to the composition of different communities. So if we had the two extremes uh, of uh, perfect repeatability and, uh, and randomness, then we're much more similar to the perfect repeatability. Of course, it's not uh, entirely repeatable, but it's much more closer 
much closer to this. Um, and again, what does it mean for predictability? If we know that things are repeatable, uh, then perhaps we thought if we knew what um, uh, the composition of pairs was during coevolution, we could use that to predict the composition of trios. So I'm showing you again the same example trio that we had before, and this time I'm adding information about the uh, fraction of pairs at generation 400. And based on this information, we could amend our prediction, and this is this new cross here, um, for the composition of trios, and it's much more accurate, it's much more similar to the observed composition. Again, quantifying across uh, all trios, we add this blue line, and it gives us the prediction error based on the pair composition during coevolution at the same generation as we're trying to predict the composition of the trios. And we can see that unlike before, the prediction uh, error remains low uh, throughout the experiment, indicating that by knowing what the pair composition is during coevolution, we could make pretty accurate prediction most of the time about the trio composition. So to quickly summarize what I told you so far, um, by looking at hundreds of communities, we could show that the community composition typically changes within a few hundred generations of coevolution. that these changes that occur in composition are fairly repeatable, and that the coevolution of pairs is predictive of trios. Uh, that didn't have to be the case. It could have been that things were repeatable, but that the evolution that occurred in pairs was different uh, than the um, evolution that occurred in trios, but that seemed to be um, fairly uh, unusual in our data. So, of course, there are still many outstanding questions, and the ones that we're most excited about are, I showed you that there's variability in communities, stability and repeatability. We don't know what determines that, and we'd like to find out. Uh, we don't know what's the difference in the selection forces and adaptations that occur when species evolve on their own versus when they co-evolve with others. And we also don't know how partner-specific is adaptation or evolution. Does it matter whether you're evolving with species A or species B? Uh, so now we're trying to address these questions by looking at more mechanistic aspects of our evolved strains like their carbon utilization and specific mutations. And if that sounds exciting to you, then uh, we have open positions, and please get in touch. And with that, I'd like to thank, first and foremost, Nitai Moroz, uh, who did the bulk of this work, as well as the rest of the lab and our funding sources, and I'll be happy to take There we go. Uh... Excellent. Um, it looks like there's a, an open question uh, on whether there is a relationship between uh, what you found in 2017 Nature Eco Evo paper, uh, the predictions deteriorate as you add more and more species to what you and uh, to what you describe now, and B that predictions deteriorate over evolutionary time scales. What is the effect of strain level diversity? Um, yeah. So maybe maybe I'll start with the second one, uh, which I think is more straightforward. Um, so we don't know what the effect of strain level diversity is um, because we haven't characterized the, the strain level diversity yet, uh, but we have some preliminary indications that show that when we pick up different, um, different clones from the evolved communities, they behave differently. Uh, so we think that there is strain level diversity and that it might be important. We're trying to figure that out now. Um, regarding the first question, uh, I'm not sure that they're related. I think that predictability deteriorates when you add more species for different reasons than it does during coevolution. Um, what happens when you add more species during coevolution? We've actually done these experiments with up to, I think, 12 strain or species. Um, it's just that you can't resolve the composition by plating. You have to do sequencing, and the sequencing is still uh, we're waiting for answers. 